Last year, I released a video where I told you about a couple of Halloween-themed MacGyver episodes, those being the Phantom of the Opera riff Cleo Rocks and Halloween Nights, which is set at a costume party for professional assassins, both of which feature MacGyver's deadly and deliciously camp arch-nemesis Murdoch. But there is another episode a spooky episode. And last year's MacGyver Halloween video was so much fun, I figured I'd come back this year and do it again with a look back at the first episode of season four of the classic MacGyver series originally airing on Halloween in 1988, written by Gene Hansen and Rick Drew and John Shepard, directed by Michael Vehar, entitled The Secret of Parker House. As with Cleo Rocks, which originally aired the following February, The Secret of Parker House guest stars Terry Hatcher as the beautiful, charming, and kinda ditzy Penny Parker. The brunette Chrissy Snow to MacGyver's bemulleted Jack Tripper. Only Mac's feelings for Penny are brotherly and platonic, while Jack was absolutely up for it with Chrissy. And Janet. And Cindy and Terry. And pretty much everybody but Lana. Poor Lana. It's her rotten luck. Jack just didn't dig older women. Except for the times he did. See, that joke never made sense to me. Why would an eager and prolific horn dog like Jack Tripper not be attracted to a woman like Lana? Of course, in real life, the dynamics of interpersonal relationships and sexual chemistry are complex, so it could be for one or several of any number of reasons, but Three's Company wasn't real life, was it? So MacGyver, as the episode opens, MacGyver, driving his Jeep, you're damn right, is taking Penny to pick up the keys to the haunted mansion she just inherited. The house belonged to Penny's Aunt Betty, who apparently went a little cuckoo after her husband, a noted bootlegger and gambler, was killed by gangsters. Betty became a recluse, never leaving the house, until eventually she not only left, but disappeared altogether. She hasn't been seen since Halloween 1958, which just so happens to have been 30 years ago to the day. All of this info comes to MacGyver and Penny courtesy of Sylvia Lang, publisher of the local paper and designated backstory dispenser. She's holding the keys to the house, and in addition to a bunch of exposition about Aunt Betty, Sylvia also shares that the townsfolk around here think the house is haunted, something Penny herself has suspected. Though, Sylvia adds, most people don't take the haunting story seriously, which prompts a teasing I told you so nudge from MacGyver, who was just telling Penny in the Jeep how there's no such thing as ghosts and supernatural explanations are the province of the ignorant and the weak-minded. Only, he's not that much of a dick about it because, you know, he's MacGyver. They pull up to the house. Penny's like, ooh, what a spooky old place. MacGyver's like, Jesus Christ, Penny, it's not haunted. There are no haunted houses. Now shut up. Shut up. Despite MacGyver's skepticism, the atmosphere at the old Parker place is undeniably creepy. The high ceilings are hung with spider webs. The front door likes to close itself, even when a chair is wedged against it to prevent it from doing just that. And a few minutes after they arrive, a thunderstorm rolls in. Thanks to the mysterious self-closing door, MacGyver, who has gone out to the Jeep to bring in some groceries, ends up stuck in the rain for a minute before Penny lets him back in. Fortunately, Mac thinks to pull his jacket up over his head and his mullet, both the delicately feathered business in the front and the manfully unmanicured party in the back, is unharmed by the downpour. Inside, behind a door that creaks open just in time to catch her attention, Penny discovers her Aunt Betty's old bedroom. Unlike the rest of the house, it has been well-maintained. But by whom? Penny finds some of Aunt Betty's dresses in the closet. Expensive, tasteful, though a few sizes too large for Penny. She also finds a music box. Ah, oh, see, that touches me. I love music boxes. There's something about those delicate chimes that is beautiful and creepy and fucking annoying all at the same time, you know? Plus, they remind me of my grandmother, Granny. This was her house, you know. She's been gone for years, but I'll never forget her. Not as long as I have her music boxes to remember her by. 
like this one. It's a cheap piece of crap she bought off QVC and it plays for release, check it out. Okay, that's enough. I'll just put this back where it belongs in Granny's old bedroom. Penny discovers this music box has a diary hidden inside it. A diary labeled, A Penny for Your Thoughts. MacGyver rolls in a birthday cake. It's Penny's birthday, by the way. Her birthday is on Halloween, isn't that neat? My wedding anniversary was on Halloween. And now I'm divorced. I'm not saying the two are related. But I'm not not saying it either. Penny samples the icing from the cake and screams, Chocolate mint banana flavor! You remembered my disgusting favorite! She shows MacGyver the diary, makes a big deal about the a penny for your thoughts thing, which MacGyver dismisses as a coincidence. Penny insists that there's more going on here than mere coincidence. Ever since she arrived, she's felt like the house is closing in on her, like she's being watched. MacGyver gets her to repeat after him that there's no such thing as ghosts. And just then, lightning strikes a gazebo outside, causing the gazebo to explode. They both head outside to see what happened, and while they're out there, Penny looks back up at the house and sees a shadowy figure lurking by one of the upstairs windows. Startled, she turns, stumbles, falls down, and finds herself face to face with a human skull. She screams like, oh my god, it's the skull of my big, fat, stylish, crazy Aunt Betty! The next day, Sheriff Howells stops by. He suggests the skull might be from a rumored Native American burial ground, but MacGyver discounts that theory, pointing to a gold tooth in the skull's mouth. Penny wonders if it might be Aunt Betty's skull, but the sheriff suggests it's just as likely to belong to Jimmy Hoffa or Amelia Earhart, which is ridiculous, as everyone knows Amelia Earhart changed her name and got a job as an assistant DA in New York City before being fatally shot at a courthouse in 1999. Sheriff Howells leaves, and we get a point-of-view shot of someone observing MacGyver and Penny from an upstairs window. Later, MacGyver is reading Aunt Betty's diary and shows how the handwriting deteriorates from neat to unintelligible scribbling, possibly suggesting her descent into madness. Penny's like, I sure wish we could find out if that skull is Aunt Betty. MacGyver's like, oh, that's easy, and he goes into town. While MacGyver is away, Penny discovers a portrait hanging upstairs with the face cut out. I wonder who did that? Do you think it was the mysterious person in the house who's been spying out that upstairs window? Why do you think they did that? Meanwhile, MacGyver has dropped in on Sylvia at the newspaper office, hoping to find a picture of Aunt Betty, but he discovers that the photos of Betty in the old issues of the newspaper have also been cut out. Do you think that means the portrait in the house was also a picture of Betty? Sure seems like it. Penny is in her aunt's bedroom, reading her diary, where Betty recorded that she felt trapped in the house and also something about there being a monster. Then the house does this funny thing where it rumbles and shakes and the portraits start falling off the wall. So Penny decides the best thing to do is run screaming outside. She hears strange noises coming from underneath the tarp covering the area around the gazebo where the skull was found and nearly caves in MacGyver's skull because it turns out it's MacGyver under the tarp. He collects the skull, which the sheriff specifically asked not be disturbed until he could have forensics experts come examine the scene, and takes it into the house. And then what he does is, he takes some art supplies, which he picked up while he was in town, and he uses pencil erasers and some clay to sculpt a reconstruction of the person's face on top of the skull. The actual human skull. The actual human skull that may be crucial evidence in a crime. like. What if this was a murder? How could this skull possibly be admissible in court? What's the prosecutor going to tell the judge? Yes, your honor, that's the victim's skull. Oh, the clay face? Some guy with no relevant credentials but a preposterously broad skill set, which apparently includes forensic sculpture, did that. Because he wanted to see what it would look like. Please don't declare a mistrial, please. Anyway, MacGyver finishes his art project, and it turns out this is the skull of Aunt Betty. How does MacGyver know this without ever having seen a picture of Aunt Betty? Because the face on the skull looks exactly like Penny. Well, not exactly. 
It looks about as much like Penny as the head that blind girl sculpts in the Hello Music video looks like Lionel Richie. So, I mean, it's in the ballpark. The sheriff isn't happy about MacGyver tampering with evidence. He's like, do you know what kind of penalty you could face for this? I ought to bust you. Next time, use your head. I'm out of here. Penny says something about her coffee tasting bitter, then heads upstairs, where she dances around to the tune of that music box and suddenly seems a lot more comfortable in the house. Home, she murmurs. I've come home. She puts on one of Aunt Betty's old dresses, the one she's wearing in the faceless portrait, while the creepy guy we saw looking out the window watches through a hole in the wall. Not cool, man. Not cool when Norman Bates did it. Not cool when you do it. I mean, Norman Bates did some other stuff that was worse, but that doesn't make the peeping okay. Penny goes over to the window and finds a ring in the flower box. While she's looking at it, the peeper comes out of a hidden door and sneaks up on her, apparently thinking she's Betty. Meanwhile, MacGyver is outside examining the rest of the bones found under the gazebo. He notices that when he scrapes his blade against them, it makes sparks. Do you see what kind of health problems people had to deal with before food regulation? This is why the FDA is so important. MacGyver hears Penny screaming from inside the house and races in to see what's going on. When he gets to the bedroom, she's gone. He finds her empty coffee cup, which she dropped to the floor earlier, and notices some powder residue. He also finds the ring from the flower box on the floor in front of the closet. It bears an inscription, forever, E-P and C-H. MacGyver finds the secret door in the closet and opens it, revealing a staircase leading down. At the bottom of the stairs, he finds a candlelit shrine to Aunt Betty made up of all the pictures of her that have been cut out from everywhere. For some reason, the musical score treats this revelation as romantic and heartwarming rather than chilling and grotesque. MacGyver just seems kind of perplexed by it, which is marginally more appropriate, I guess. Penny is lying down in a little room next to the stairs. She doesn't recognize MacGyver at first, but when she comes to her senses, she tells him she saw the monster. Then the big galoot who was hiding behind the secret door jumps out and beats MacGyver unconscious just in time for the commercial. After the break, MacGyver wakes up to find the big guy trying to hold a rag over his face. He jumps to his feet and grabs a stick to defend himself, but the big guy cowers in fear. Penny comes in and explains that the big guy's name is Virgil, and this is all perfectly innocent. He didn't mean to knock MacGyver out. He was just being protective and doesn't know his own strength. And the rag he was holding over MacGyver's face is just an ice pack for the bump he inadvertently left on MacGyver's head. And the peeping at her through the wall as she got dressed was just Virgil being a pervert and wanting to jack off to the sight of a naked Terry Hatcher, which is no excuse. You want to jack off to naked Terry Hatcher? You watch the cool surface like the rest of us did when we were teenagers. I mean, this is 1988. She hasn't made that movie yet. So you know what? You wait. You don't spy through a hole in the wall. You wait, Virgil. MacGyver tells Penny that her coffee was drugged with a hallucinogen, and they walk into a room with a big boiler, which MacGyver assumes correctly was where Penny's uncle, the one killed by gangsters, did his bootlegging. Virgil explains that he used to run the still that made the booze. Booze which Aunt Betty used to drink a lot of. Quite a lot of, in fact. MacGyver notices some lead patches on the pipes of the still and deduces that the liquor produced by the still was contaminated by lead, which explains why Betty's bones sparked when MacGyver scraped his knife against them. They were covered with lead phosphide. She drank so much lead that her bones made sparks? But that's not what killed her? Sheriff Howells and Sylvia walk in, and Howells announces that, actually, it was Virgil who killed Betty by accidentally throwing her out of a window. Howells and Sylvia have known about it all these years, but didn't tell anyone to protect poor, simple-minded Virgil, who also happens to be Sylvia's brother. But when Howells blames Virgil for Betty's death, Virgil protests. And MacGyver's not buying it either. He holds up the ring from the window box and points out the initials. E.P. for Elizabeth Parker and C.H. for... Cliff 
Howells. She must have dropped it when you pushed her out the window 30 years ago, huh, MacGyver says. He also asks Sylvia about a Dr. Sims he read about in the old newspaper articles. Turns out old Doc Sims was caught performing illegal abortions. That explains those big dresses in the closet, Penny says. Aunt Betty wasn't stylish and fat. She was stylish and pregnant. MacGyver puts it all together. 30 years ago, Howells had just been elected sheriff. Him having a child out of wedlock with Betty, the local lead-swilling lunatic, would cause a scandal that could ruin his career. So, when Betty refused to have the abortion, Howells killed her. Sheriff Howells, who is holding the ring, the only physical evidence that even suggests his involvement in Betty's death, and who has somehow managed to keep his guilt a secret for 30 years, is like, you know what? Screw it. Confesses and pulls his gun. But since this is MacGyver, instead of just shooting them, he locks them in the room and turns the boiler, the controls for which are conveniently located on the other side of the door, all the way up. With no way out, a boiler building up to an explosion, and an alcohol still filled with highly flammable moonshine, MacGyver does the only thing he can, the obvious thing, really, and uses a length of pipe and a valve with a brass patch to turn the overheating boiler into a cannon. When the patch ruptures, the steam blows through the pipe, sending it crashing through the wall. They all climb out to discover the body of Sheriff Howells, who has just been killed in his car by the collapse of the remains of the gazebo, which sent a wooden beam in through his window to... crush his chest, I guess. He saw it coming and tried to get out, but his seatbelt was stuck. Well, what a time for that to happen. Maybe, Penny says, someone stopped him from getting out of the car in time and she points at an inscription carved on the side of the beam that killed Howell. A heart, and inside the heart, Cliff and Betty. Aw, oh, they carved their names on the side of a ceiling beam of a gazebo where nobody would ever see it. I'm sorry. I'm a sucker for romance. The cops come and take Virgil away, but MacGyver's not worried. They probably won't press charges, since Virgil's only crime was being in love with Betty Parker. And being a peeping Tom, but nobody knows about that. And plus, it's 1988, so they probably wouldn't care anyway. Virgil's gonna be fine. MacGyver's like, see, Penny? Everything had a simple, rational explanation, just like I told you. No ghosts, no supernatural. But as they turn to walk back into the house, they hear the music box playing. Which means... There are ghosts, I guess? Or maybe one of the cops on the scene opened it? No, no, the existence of ghosts is definitely the more likely explanation. You're right. Hey, that's the end! MacGyver as a series has its own distinctive voice and point of view, but it's also very much a product of its time and its style and tone, as well as the types of stories its creators choose to tell, are significantly influenced by the kind of show it is. This is a 1980s American network TV action-adventure show right down to the bone. And just like other stalwarts of that kind of show that we still remember fondly today, Knight Rider, The A-Team, Magnum P.I., even Quantum Leap and Baywatch, both of which didn't debut until 1989, but perfectly fit the mold of 1980s action-adventure shows nonetheless, MacGyver often makes use of what we might call stock premises. These are story premises that are specific enough to be familiar once we've seen them a few times, but general enough to allow each individual series to color them in according to their particular style. One such premise is the Haunted House episode, which is what we have here with The Secret of Parker House. If you're not a fan of the show and only know the basic concept of it, a Haunted House episode might not seem like the best fit for MacGyver, but it's a mark of the show's versatility that The Secret of Parker House not only works, but works pretty well. Your mileage may vary, of course, and as always with MacGyver, how much you enjoy the episode depends on how seriously you take it. I don't take it very seriously at all, and it's one of my favorite shows ever. Anyway, one of the elements that is typically a part of the Haunted House show is that the house isn't actually haunted. 
It's the Scooby-Doo principle. It wasn't a ghost. It was just the crooked estate lawyer who wanted to scare away the rightful heirs so he could keep the inheritance for himself. Or, in the case of The Secret of Parker House, it wasn't a ghost. It was just the hulking but kind-hearted simpleton who had transferred his troubling sexual fixation with Penny's aunt onto Penny herself. No ghost, though. What a relief. The not-really-haunted part of the Haunted House plot works well for a MacGyver episode because MacGyver is a man of science. That automatically gives him an angle in the story that flows naturally from who he is. He's skeptical of the claims that the house is haunted, as we would expect him to be. And so, when apparently supernatural things start to happen, he's going to try to get to the bottom of it all. And alongside MacGyver, you've got Penny, a more naive and credulous character who is going to be far less skeptical of the idea that there are restless spirits floating around in her new house. Hey, that's the start of a story right there. The Haunted House plot works well with MacGyver's character, but it presents a bit of a challenge when it comes to the defining conceit of the series. What sets MacGyver apart from the heroes of other action-adventure series? What's his thing? He's the guy who invents or improvises his way out of trouble. When the premise is MacGyver's friend inherits a haunted house, the opportunities for Mac to whip out the Swiss Army knife don't exactly suggest themselves. But, again, Provided you don't take it that seriously, this allows the show to play to one of its strengths. Because one of the most delightful things about MacGyver to me is how, as the show went on, the writers had to keep stretching further and further to come up with stuff for MacGyver to invent. Or to put MacGyver in situations where he had to improvise his way out. The ending of The Secret of Parker House is fairly standard MacGyver stuff. Mac and Penny and Sylvia and Virgil are trapped in the basement with a boiler that's about to explode, so Mac rigs up a makeshift cannon that harnesses the force of the exploding boiler to blow a hole in the wall and allow them to escape. It's utterly ridiculous, but in a way that lines up well with the general premise of the series. I have no problem with the escape from the basement boiler room. It's some good, solid, stick-to-your-ribs MacGyverin. But I really love MacGyver's human skull art project. I love it so much. The escape from the basement is good, but it's just one thing. The writers of this episode wouldn't settle for that. They wanted more than the bare minimum. And just look at how far afield they were willing to go in order to meet that standard. The problem? MacGyver and Penny find a skull that may or may not be the remains of her Aunt Betty, and they want to find out whether it is or not. There are any number of ways through which to solve this problem, legal, official ways to solve this problem. But once you realize that, you still have to ask yourself, what would MacGyver do? He'd stick that skull on a mannequin head base and use some pencil erasers and modeling clay he just bought at Michael's to sculpt a complete and apparently at least reasonably accurate forensic reconstruction of the dead woman's face onto her actual skull. That's what he'd do. And when the sheriff points out that what MacGyver's done to the skull is wrong and illegal, MacGyver's just like... And yes, the sheriff turns out to be the murderer, but any official in his place would have the same reaction. Because what MacGyver does to Aunt Betty's skull is so incredibly far past the limit of what is acceptable in terms of the ethics of how to handle evidence and how to treat human remains. It's bonkers. It's bonkers that MacGyver did that and had the idea to do it, and had the ability to do it. MacGyver's impossibly varied and extensive repertoire of knowledge and experience is one of the show's funniest elements. His backstory includes military service in Vietnam, going to college to earn a physics degree, and stints as an Olympic-level hockey player, a race car driver, a forest ranger, a logger, a hell fighter, and those are just the ones I can remember off the top of my head, and I guess we should find room in there somewhere for art school too. Or maybe not. Could be forensic reconstructive sculpture is just a hobby. I mean, the likeness isn't perfect, after all. 
Besides putting a face on the skull and escaping from the boiler room, there are also a couple of mini MacGyverisms, scraping the bones with his knife to show the excessive amount of lead poisoning Aunt Betty had somehow lived with, using a candle to identify the source of a draft, which leads to finding the secret door. And those are important, too, because we can't forget that our boy Mac is always thinking he's not just a guy with a utility knife and a mullet. There's a big old brain under that mullet and skilled, experienced hands wielding that knife, and also bright white sneakers, and a cool Jeep. And I'll tell you what, he fills out a tank top all right too, doesn't he? He's multifaceted, is what I'm saying. And he can handle any challenge, any adversary that crosses his path, even a crooked sheriff who's gotten away with murder for 30 years, and even a ghost. Not that MacGyver would ever need to handle the challenge of a ghost, since as we all know, there's no such thing as... Granny? Granny, if that's you, could you knock it off with the music box? Please? Jesus.